All right, folks. So looks like we've got about 17 people on the call and I bet we'll have a few more stragglers that come in. Uh, today, we've, we've got a great uh, presenter, Luke Marsden, is going to help us out and present on uh, one of his latest endeavors with uh, uh, dot .mesh. And then after that, we've got kind of an open agenda. So we can either end the meeting early or we can figure out what to chat about. Uh, and I've got an update regarding the, the KubeCon sessions that, uh, that we've been working with. So at this point, let me pass it over to Luke and uh, let's hear what he's doing today. Awesome, thank you, Clinton. And uh, hi, everyone. It's um, uh, great to see so many people here. Uh, recognize some of the names. Um, so, so great to see you all. Um, it, I've been having some uh, connectivity issues. So if I drop out, please tell me as soon as possible <laughs> so that I can slow down and maybe switch, switch Wi-Fi's and, uh, and so on. So hopefully this won't be too painful. Um, cool, so I'll share my screen. Um, I've got a few slides and then um, I've got uh, a couple of demos. So I'm gonna pray to the demo gods. Um, so we just just fixed a bunch of bugs. <laughs> so um, here we go. Um, cool, so dot mesh is about bringing data into the circle of control. Um, but before I talk about that, um, I just wanna talk a little bit about uh, what a bad day at work looks like when you're, when you're doing software. Um, when when you're doing cloud native, when you're when you're doing DevOps, um, so so we spoke to probably about a few dozen uh, companies um, who are doing cloud native, doing Kubernetes, doing DevOps about about their use cases and and about their pain points at the end of last year, um, and the the following um, uh, memes capture uh, some of the themes that we heard and. Uh, the, the first one was that one does not simply capture the state of four microservices at once. Uh, and the idea here is that even when you're in a development environment, um, polyglot persistence, i.e. the fact that multiple microservices have multiple databases, um, uh, results in the complexity of sharing that state with anyone uh, being so high that basically no one does it. Um, this means that if you're a developer and you've got like four microservices on your laptop and they've got a Redis and a Postgres and a um, and an Elasticsearch, then you you just don't bother trying to capture all of those states to to show a colleague an interesting state. Instead, um, you either get them to come and look at your computer if you're in the same building, or maybe you let them have a teammate session um, uh, if you're trying to pair remotely. Um, or you depend on using a, a, a shared staging environment, in which case there's often contention over those staging environments. That's what we heard when we spoke to people. Um, so the, the second problem we heard was, and I've, I've modified an XKCD that uh, may, may seem familiar. Um, it used to be that the, this XKCD used to say that the number one programmer excuse for legitimately slacking off was that my code was compiling. Um, but um, it's uh, increasingly the case, um, uh, so it's 2018, compilers have got better, um, and it's actually integration tests that, that tend to, um, to slow people down the most now. So we heard that often slow and flaky CI systems uh, were what was causing um, people's, uh, people's lives to be painfully slow um, when, when they were trying to get software deployed and, and make changes to a code base. Um, just checking you can still hear me clearly because I just had a message flash up that say my internet right. connection is unstable. You're good. You've been perfect. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Amazing. Um, the wonders of 4G. Um, so, uh, so then um, the next problem that we heard, uh, this is a common one, um, was that we, we made a change to the software. Uh, the tests all passed in CI, but then the thing blew up when we deployed it to production. Um, and um, this is almost always because production is just a different environment to, uh, uh, to any of your other test environments. However good you're testing, um, the production is always going to be different in one way or another, um, uh, even with the wonders of Kubernetes and um, uh, the fact that we're deploying the same immutable container images everywhere. Um, 
And this has led, I mean, the fact that this is hard has led to people more and more uh, talking about testing in production and testing, um, uh, testing sort of canary deployments and so on. Um, but I believe that um, if there were tools to make it easier to test more realistically and to have end-to-end -end tests that were less flaky and more reliable, um, then, uh, then there would be more testing done before you expose uh, any traffic to, to new untested code. So, um, so that, was, that was another a common theme. And then the fourth one that we heard, um, uh, really interested in, in this group's feedback on this, uh, was that, well, you can put your application in containers, um, but how do you migrate your data to the cloud? Uh, containers really don't help you uh, move data around. Um, you don't ever want to put large database dumps into, uh, into containers. Uh, they're just not designed for it, and containers don't help you um, capture databases either. Um, but um, yeah, so this was an interesting sort of theme, like how, um, how, how, I mean, Kubernetes gets you most of the way to real cloud portability. And when I say cloud portability, I mean, I, I include moving data from on-prem to, to, to a cloud provider. Um, then like, how, how do you manage the data migration? So, um, so if you take a step back and you look at the common theme between all of these things, um, well, there's problems at all stages of the, of the software lifecycle. There's problems in dev, uh, where microservices make capturing and sharing dev states hard. There's problems in CI, where end-to-end -end tests that manipulate real databases are slow and flaky. And the more realistic they are, uh, the flakier they are. And when they're flaky, it's hard to reproduce the flakes. Um, we spent about a month battling that with, in our own code, actually. Um, and then um, in production, unexpected production outages happen uh, because tests just aren't realistic enough. Uh, and obviously this plays together with the CI issue. And then finally, this cloud migration issue is that you, you containers help you get your apps to the cloud, but not their data. And so data management in cloud native is still kind of an open space. Um, so the common theme, if you really take a step back and zoom out, is that in all cases, you weren't in control of data. And if you think about what modern software um, is made up out of, well, any software is made up out of, any software application is made up out of code, infrastructure, and data. And over the last 20 years or more, uh, code has obviously been version controlled. And if you go to any team and say, do you version control your code? Then the answer is, yeah, duh, most of the time. Um, and, um, and, and what's more, um, CI and um, automated testing have made um, uh, control of code um, easier as well by being able to reliably test and reproduce the inputs to various different parts of your code and so on. So controlling code, achieving velocity through control for code is kind of a solved problem. Um, more recently, infrastructure has been moving into the fold as well. And I don't need to tell this group too much about this, but of course, um, uh, we've moved now from a world of snowflake servers into a world of declarative immutable um, infrastructure as code and your Terraform config and your Ansible config and your Docker files um, and your Docker images all live in, um, well, the Docker images don't, but everything else lives in version control and uh, the, the, the images can be created from that. So this is about controlling both the cloud resources that are deployed and also the runtime state of the servers. Um, and tools like Docker and Kubernetes um, obviously go a long way to solving, to solving that. And so we're left in the situation where data is sort of left out in the cold. Um, it isn't subject to the same um, tools and, 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 um, uh, and abilities as, uh, as modern infrastructure as code uh, to a large extent. And many of the teams that we spoke to say they were still using um, sort of old school methods for managing their data uh, they often had DBAs where you had to send them an email or open a ticket to get a, sna a snapshot of production data. And, um, and this was just slowing people down because everything else about their infrastructure was getting faster and their data was, was slowing them, keeping them back. So our mission with DotMesh is to bring data into this circle of control. Um, and so that's a very broad statement. Um, 
I'll tell you about how we plan to do that. So how do you bring data into the circle of control? Well, we propose that you use a mesh, um, our mesh. Uh, this is not a service mesh, by the way. It is like a service mesh in that it is a generic tool um, for, uh, that you can apply to any software and it will um, make it easier. Uh, but it is, it is not about um, networking, it is about storage. Um, and so um, the mesh that we propose is called dot mesh and dot hub sort of sits at the center of the mesh. And then around the side here, we have various different stages of the software development lifecycle, um, which enable various different use cases. So the first use case is that you have uh, a developer um, on a development machine and they're able to capture the state of multiple microservices at once in a unit that we call a data dot. And then once you have a data dot, um, it's possible to treat that data dot like a Git repo. And so you can do commits, uh, you can do branches, you can do push and pull. So the developer can create a commit of multiple microservices state in a single atomic um, unit, and they can push that state up to the dot hub. I think of it kind of like putting the state on the shelf. Um, and then a different developer uh, in a different time zone, in a different country, certainly on a different computer, uh, can pull that down to a different environment and have exactly the state of the application, um, not only the, uh, the code, but also the data that the developer, the first developer had. Um, and we're seeing use cases for this around things like uh, reproducing security vulnerabilities. So developer one manages to find a security bug in an application that's only, uh, that you can only demonstrate by showing the, um, the exploited state of three different data stores at the same time, because all the IDs have to line up and, and it, it involves like touching various different parts of the system. Um, they really want to be able to share that with the SecOps team. And so they can now do that uh, rather than just writing down a list of steps to reproduce, they can actually share a snapshot of the entire environment with, uh, with that team uh, by a, a sort of a, a, a snapshot in the dot hub. Another use case is taking failed CI runs. Um, so taking the output uh, of the CI system and uh, putting failed CI runs in the dot hub and that allows you to reproduce flakes um, and just pull them down to a developer's machine to get exactly the state um, of the environment that as and when it failed. Um, Another use case is taking realistic data from production and using realistic data from production via some sort of scrubbing process into a staging environment um, or using it to run automated tests in CI against um, so, so that you can run performance or acceptance tests against realistic snapshots from production. Um, and there's another use case, which is migrating apps and their data between different clusters. Uh, so notice that I turned production into two clusters, as it often will be, uh, maybe in different clouds or different regions or whatever, um, and being able to take a, a snapshot um, of that uh, production data for the entire application, not just one of its uh, uh, polyglot databases, and move that to a different cluster. Um, that's uh, sort of the, the fourth um, and final use case. So I'll pause there. Um, I've got two demos. Um, and um, so the first demo is going to be the sort of development side of, of, of the house. I'll show commits, branches, and push and, and clone to and from the dot hub. Um, and then the, the second demo is what I call a dot ops demo, um, which is migrating, uh, sort of orchestrating data replication between two separate Kubernetes clusters. Um, but just before I do the demos, I'll see any questions on the content so far. Hey, look, this is uh, yeah, a song. Question. Go, go ahead. Sorry, so so the first one is for taking a snapshot of a microservice, um, do you rely on the underlying storage infrastructure to provide the snapshot service or that's something you implement as part of dot mesh? What is it? Um, so we've implemented it as part of dot mesh. It's a layer that sits between, um, uh, between underlying reliable storage and um, uh, and, and the application, which is useful because it means it, it, it works on your laptop <laughs> as well. So, so it enables that portability between different stages of the software lifecycle. Uh, but one thing I will mention is that um, it is, um, 
we are absolutely not trying to implement a synchronously replicated block storage system. Um, so um, we work in collaboration with synchronously replicated block storage systems. So uh, we see this as, as very complementary to, to those systems like a, a Portworks or a storage OS or um, an open EBS um, uh, or a Ceph um, or in fact EBS or, or PVs on, 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 a, on a cloud provider. Um, uh, in fact, we're currently working on an integration that allows us to support failover um, uh, in production by just relying on the reliable disks provided to us uh, through Kubernetes um, using those APIs. I see. So you, you have your own, let's say, file system, snapshot mechanism, and you don't rely on AWS snapshots or Azure snapshots or Google snapshots to implement the function. That's correct. And, yes. and the second question is, um, when you talk about taking snapshots of multiple microservices, do you uh, in any way coordinate snapshots across microservices so that these are um, globally consistent pointing time snapshots or you know, do you have any guarantees for the snapshots that you take across different microservices? Like you mentioned the example of Redis, MySQL. Do you do any coordination across these micro microservices? Uh, yeah, so um, we're working on a system that will um, not require um, coordination because it will allow um, uh, consistent atomic snapshots to be taken across multiple microservices, even if they're running on different machines. So um, that's one approach. Um, there is a different approach, uh, which I've seen uh, from our friends at Kasten um, or uh, Canister, I think is the open source project, but but Kasten and K10, um, which is to to coordinate between different services. And I think it's interesting to explore both of those approaches in parallel. Okay, thank you. Hey, look, this is uh, Bassam. Uh, quick, quick question. So, so you you are on the data path then? Yes. Yes. Okay, and, and we're on the data path, but we're not providing all of the data path. We're assuming the existence of reliable disks, like reliable virtual disks underneath us. Understood. And so, so you, you, but you are on the data path in terms of, uh, you know, you said you created the dot data. Those are, you're, you're extracting all of that or packaging all of that from being on the data path? Correct. Yes, that's right. Okay. Thank you. Cool. No problem. Um, Great. So yeah, I'll I'll run through some demos, and there'll be time for more questions afterwards. Um, so the um, try and make the, the Zoom thing get out of my way. Um, so yeah, the first it's always in my way. <laughs> the first thing um, I will do is um, I'll just run through it. So the development side of the house. Um, can be, can be shown using this, this very simple demo that we've got on our website. So um, if you want to try this yourself, uh, feel free to check it out afterwards um, or, you know, whenever you like. Um, and um, yeah, if you go to our website, this is uh, under try on Catacoda. So um, just click try on the tutorial and you can kick the tires. Um, so just to start by showing, um, it's very easy to install dot mesh. Um, I have here um, uh, a Linux machine, and um, it's just part of this hosted tutorial environment. This works just as well if you're running it on your laptop, um, on Mac OS um, or, uh, or Linux. Um, and installing dot mesh is just a matter of uh, running a curl to download um, and chmod a uh, a, a, a Go binary, and then um, we run the single command called dm cluster init. Um, dm cluster init um, assumes that Docker is installed, um, and it then uh, pulls down the dot mesh server image. It creates a new a new dot mesh cluster, um, and it only takes a few seconds. So the idea there is um, that even if you're using a if, even if you're using dot mesh on your laptop, you still create a cluster. It's just a single node cluster. And so all dot mesh clusters are alike. They're all sort of homogenous. Um, and you can push and pull between any dot mesh cluster. Um, so I can check that that came up. 
uh, yep, that's running 0.3.3. .3. That's good. We released that earlier today. Um, so uh, this is really, um, really fresh, fresh bits. Um, so I can then start up a, a really simple um, Docker Compose application. And um, I can then do a DM list. And so you can see, um, I'll show you inside the Docker Compose application first, actually. Um, so if you look at docupose.yaml, uh, looks like I've got quite a lot of latency. Yeah. Um, so inside the docker compose.yaml, um, I have, um, it's just a, a regular docker compose file with a web and a Redis. Um, and I'll show a Kubernetes example in a minute, by the way. This is just the sort of the the, the start, the early, the, the the very simple version using Docker Compose. And it's just using a, a Docker volume driver called DM. And that Docker volume driver uh, refers to a Moby counter volume. And so when I did Docker Compose up on this file, um, that's why um, you saw um, uh, this Moby counter in the output of DM list. So now if you look again at DM list, you can see dot mesh knows that there's a Moby counter dot. Um, that dot is currently on the master branch. Um, uh, it knows which server it's on, it knows which containers are using it, and it knows how big it is. So 19 kilobytes is, is just the, the size of, a, a, it's basically the size of an empty file system um, uh, with a, just a, a, a tiny Redis file in it. Um, so I can now um, commit the empty state. Uh, and now if I do dm log, that's the uh, the empty state. There's there's nothing in this commit at all. I'm then going to make a new branch. So I'm going to create the branch called branch A. And now I can show you the app. So this is this is the application. It's really super simple. Um, it uh, it's an app that lets you click on the screen and add logos, and it stores the position of the logos in a Redis database. And the Redis is configured to be persistent, so it's writing to disk. Hey Luke, um, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. Uh, Feel free to add 10 more minutes to the presentation. I think we have a, a light agenda after this, so take your time, whatever you need to okay, do. OK, great. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Um, so I will uh, take my time in order to spell out CNCF. <laughs> um, and um, then the idea here is that um, the position of these logos on the screen is, is recorded inside um, inside the Redis database, CNCF. Yeah, I spelled it right. That's good. Um, and if I do DM list now, I don't know. Yeah, I can see that there's uh, 21 kilobytes of dirty data. So that's 21 kilobytes of clicking um, that I've recorded. I can do another commit um, and say, hello, CNCF. Um, and that's my commit message. Now if I do DM log, um, it says, hello, CNCF. So just to prove to you that that's on a separate branch from the master branch, uh, I can now switch back to the master branch and notice that all the dots or all of the icons disappear. Um, in fact, this is slightly more impressive if you actually pull, pull this out so you can see it at the same time. Uh, let me just do this. Hopefully that will work. So yeah, I, I've, I'm on the master branch. I can switch back to branch A. And notice that um, uh, all of my um, all of my state comes back. Um, and so, what's going on under the hood here is that um, dot mesh is coordinating switching out the state of the file system underneath the running container. Um, but before, but don't worry, it's not that scary. We we also coordinate stopping the container, the Redis container, and then starting it again around that that switch of that data. Um, so it's done in a way that's that that doesn't doesn't break the application. Um, it just allows us, as a in a development mode, to very rapidly switch between different variants, different versions of development data. Um, so I'll go back to the master branch again, see the data disappear, and then go back to branch A. Hey, so hey Luke, what, one quick quick question. Some some uh, systems, I don't know if Redis is one of them, require some kind of quiescing before you can take their data because they, they keep you know aggressive caches or, or in memory state uh, do you do anything to kind of help them put their state on disk or flush out their state to disk 
before you capture no, it? We don't have a Quiesce API at the moment, but we'll build one as soon as we need it. Um, we haven't yet found an application um, that a user or customer wants to use that 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 actually needs that. Um, we're seeing uh, a lot of usage of, uh, of like MySQL InnoDB or Postgres, uh, where they have write ahead logs, and the only thing that we need from the application from from the application or the database is that it's crash consistent. So, okay. so still rela related 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 to that. Yeah, related to that, then some some applications, MySQL is being one of them, actually can store multiple volumes, and the crash consistency is actually a point in time consistent across those volumes. Say, you know, uh, a bin log or a, a mm -hmm. redo log and data log, data are could be separated. Do you actually have a crash consistent story across volumes? So we have a feature called subdots. And uh, what subdots allow you to do is to store sort of more than one volume inside a volume, as it were, like more than one dot inside a dot. Uh, uh -huh. um, so, um, uh, and the, the snapshots or the commits, are, to use the Git language, um, the, the commits um, are consistent across all the subdots in a dot. Um, and and um, uh, from a container perspective, that works if the container, say, mounts multiple volumes? Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah, or even if you have multiple containers uh, belonging to multiple microservices uh, mounting uh, multiple subdots. Uh, and, and, and so you have a point of consistency across volumes of a given container. Uh, yes, and potentially across multiple containers as well. Okay. Very cool. Cool. Um, so um, the next part of the first demo is just to demonstrate push and pull. So um, I've got um, a local environment here. Uh, I'll go out into my Mobi counter. I've got Docker running on my Mac. Um, and I've got uh, dot mesh installed. And dot mesh is completely fresh. Oops, that's the wrong cluster. DM remote switch local. You can kind of see what I'm going to do in my next demo. So DM list here. Yeah, OK, so this is my local remote, which is, sounds kind of funny. But you can do DM remote minus V, and you can see the different remotes that are available to, to the dot mesh client. Um, it's kind of like put, pointing kubectl at different clusters, right? So in this case, I'm pointing dot mesh at, at the local uh, remote, which is just the, the dot mesh server that's running on my laptop. Um, so if. Um, so what I can now do is I can go to our SaaS service, which is this thing called the dot hub. Um, and I don't have any dots in my account. Um, but what I can do is I can export my hub username just as a convenience, just Luke Marsden. Um, and I'm going to go and need my API key, uh, which I get from settings. And then I can copy it without leaking it. Um, and then I can add um, the hub as a remote to uh, dot mesh inside this ephemeral demo environment that we have here. Um, and I can see that I've now got uh, hub as a remote here. Um, so I can now push that um, dot called Mobi counter. Um, and I can push a specific branch of it as well. Um, and I can push that up to, uh, to dot hub. Um, and that was a small number of kilobytes. Uh, and if I go to dot hub now, I can see that it's arrived. And you can kind of see that um, if dot mesh is like Git, then dot hub is like GitHub, is the sort of general idea we're going for here. Um, and so you can see that that's arrived. Um, you can see that there's a, a branch A. Um, and uh, hopefully, oh, yeah, my internet connection is just being slow. Um, so on branch A, uh, you can see the commit hello CNCF, which I pushed from, from the command line there. Um, so the bonus section here is that I'm going to pull this branch A down onto my local machine. Um, so I don't need to install dot mesh because I already have it. Uh, I also already have the Mobi counter repo. Um, but what I will do is um, let me just check DM list is definitely empty. So the first thing I'll do is um, I will uh, clone the Mobi counter repo. Uh, 
GitHub username. Yep. So I'm going to clone that down from from dot hub. Um, and where, one way in which this varies slightly from Git um, is that it um, it only uh, pulls down um, the one um, uh, only pulls down the master branch. There we go. It's being slow because my 4G connection is being slow. And um, then I can do DM list. And that's pulled down Moby counter on the master branch. You can also see it's pulled down that one commit on the master branch. Um, I can um, switch, make that the active dot. Um, I can now start up the Docker Compose app. Uh, and this might take a minute because I wiped everything out. Um, but the idea here is that, yeah, this is going to pull down um, uh, the, the Docker Compose application. Um, it's going to bring up the, the Redis instance. Um, and uh, then it's going to um, start up exactly the same environment that I had um, uh, th that I had in the demo environment locally on my machine. So just waiting a second here. Uh, while we wait for that, I know I didn't bring it up yet. Um, any questions at this point while we wait for Docker pull? It's the best thing to do in all demos is watch people waiting for Docker pull. Look, can you talk about which parts of this are open source and which parts are closed source? Yes. Um, everything is open source apart from the web interface. Okay. So that was a nice, <clears throat> nice simple answer. Um, <laughs> Yeah. I had a question when they uh, go ahead. What's the uh, what's the economic model for dot mesh? Is, there, is it subscription based or open core or how are you guys thinking about that? Yeah, so for the dot hub, um, we're thinking about that. Uh, we're thinking about the dot hub as a SaaS product um, where you will pay um, uh, money to store data on on the dot hub. Um, we hope to add more value to the data in the dot hub so that we can justify charging above uh, cloud storage fees because we don't want to be in that game. Um, the, um, uh, we will be adding more features to the dot hub as well. We think of dot mesh as an open source primitive and it has, it's really important that the dot mesh um, is a good open source primitive. It has to be complete. It has to be production ready. Um, I, I don't want to end up in a position where we offer a sort of crippled version of the functionality under a free license, um, but you have to pay us to use something that you can actually use for serious, but for real. Um, the, um, the idea is that, that dot mesh is a complete open source primitive and that the value that we add in the dot hub is going to be uh, built on top of that open source primitive um, using our own APIs um, to, to implement the features on top of it. Does that answer the question? Yep, thank you. Perfect timing, because uh, we now finally have our local Moby counter here. And so it's on the master branch locally, which means that we're not going to see uh, the state here. The next thing we need to do is uh, pull down um, that branch A state um, that we pushed up to the hub. And again, that will probably take a few seconds because my 4G is being slow. There we go. Um, and then we can check out, uh, we can do DM branch. You can see we've got branch A available and we can check out branch A. And then over here, bingo. We saw that our data moved uh, from the online demo environment uh, to my local development environment. Um, so yeah, that's the first demo. Um, if we've got time for another one, I can attempt a slightly more challenging one. Yeah, um, I think you're good. Go ahead. Cool. Um, so um, so yes, I've got uh, this other example. Um, so 
I've so far I've shown local development, Docker, Docker Compose. That's all fine, um, but it's much more interesting to talk about production use cases with Kubernetes as well. Um, so we've done a Kubernetes integration. We've got a dynamic provisioner and a flex volume driver uh, with the implementing CSI. Um, and um, if you go to our setup guide, then there's uh, instructions for GKE, instructions for AKS on Azure, um, and also instructions for generic Kubernetes. Um, so feel free to try it out, kick the tires. You can install this on a cluster. And when it's running in clustered mode, um, it gives you all the same features that it's running uh, that, that you get when it's running on a single machine. Um, so what I can do here is um, I'm just going to, so I've got two different um, contexts um, in KubeCuffle. Uh, one of them is this, um, uh, this GKE <coughs> in Europe, like the kubectl get nodes, um, hopefully. I guess this is where we learn how many round trips <laughs> this takes. Um, what I might do is try turning off my video. OK. Yeah, that helped. Oh, my latency is down. OK, so um, I've got uh, this. I've got a cluster in Europe. Um, and I've got another cluster in the US. These are both GKE clusters because it was easy, um, but there's nothing about this demo that's specific to GKE. This would work from on-prem to cloud or from one cloud provider to another and so on. Um, so yeah, I've also got my, my nodes in the US. Um, and um, so I can then demonstrate uh, migrating a sort of reasonably substantial MySQL database from, uh, from one continent to another. Um, we uh, need to switch back to Europe. Um, and then I'm going to apply some manifests. So there's a loader manifest, a MySQL manifest, and one of my least favorite pieces of software ever, PHP MyAdmin, uh, that we packaged up in Kubernetes. Um, and um, we can now switch uh, the DM remote to that GKE cluster. And uh, we can watch. Um, that MySQL dot fill up. We were a bit too slow. Uh, if you're fast enough, then you get to see that going from zero dirty data to 115 megs. And that's just MySQL saying, here are my, uh, my stock um, MySQL data files. I can then commit my empty state. Um, and I can now do, I can do DM list, by the way. DM list shows me my MySQL dot. Just very quickly, I'll show you how that hooks up into Kubernetes universe. Um, it is uh, the MySQL PVC, um, and that is that refers as an annotation to dot mesh namespace and dot mesh name, um, and that's my, that name MySQL dot is what came out here in the DM list. Um, I can now run this loader pod, um, and um, the uh, loader pod just ingests a couple of hundred meg. Um, of data from um, that that we just bundled into the the container image from for the loader uh, to get us to get us started here, and it's just some fairly boring sample data about empl employees and departments and and so on, um, and so what you what you can see here is um, that we've deployed a SQL. Um, instance onto Kubernetes uh, with dot mesh installed on Kubernetes. And now if you open um, uh, the web interface, then you can see um, that we've got some employees in the employees database, for example. So Georgie Facello, these uh, are completely made up people apparently. So any, um, uh, any similarity to real people is purely coincidental. Um, we can now see, uh, uh, DM list. So we, we've got the full size of the dot, uh, but we've also got one of the commits and the dirty data on top of that initial commit is 280 meg. So I can now um, uh, do a, uh, commit my bulk data set and I can push that um, from Europe um, to the US. Um, 
And the good news is that this is not going via my laptop because I'm pretty sure my 4G connection isn't going to sustain 20 megabytes a second. Um, this is uh, being orchestrated by the DM client um, on my machine to coordinate um, that data migration, data replication uh, between these two uh, GKE clusters. So um, I think the data is going over Google's private network between, between Europe and the US. Um, so that's nice. Um, I can now switch over to uh, uh, GKE US. Um, I can see that my data has arrived. Um, and uh, I'm now going to switch back to Europe. Now, um, I'm going to simulate the fact that um, I did a bulk transfer of a big database and that it took some time. Maybe in reality, it took several hours because it does actually take, you can't break the laws of physics. Um, but uh, I'll also simulate the fact that while that data, while that snapshot, that commit was being replicated um, over the Atlantic, um, more data was uh, still being written to the live database in Europe. Um, so I'm going to simulate that with a little script that adds some more data, and that just loads uh, this SQL dump called Employees Extra. Um, and um, I'm then going to um, switch over to Europe. And at this point, it's scheduled downtime. Uh, we're going to try and make the scheduled downtime as short as possible. So um, I just deleted the MySQL pod um, in Europe. So MySQL is now down. We can commit our secondary data set. Uh, we can push um, whatever the delta is from the first data set to the next data set. And um, then we can switch over to our US cluster. Uh, we can deploy our manifests. And with any luck, we can see that things are starting up. So at this point, it's probably just pulling some container images. OK, and it's all running. Um, and now I can open my other IP address. And with any luck, I can see that my database is back up. And now it's in the US. So um, here we can go and look at the employees. And we added some of the names of the people on our team um, just for fun. Um, and uh, so you, that indicates the bulk data that was transferred initially, plus the delta of data Thanks. that was uh, uh, captured up until the, the, the few seconds of scheduled downtime. So that's just another use case for dot mesh. Um, it can be used for moving data around between production systems um, as, as well as development. Um, and that's it, really. Um, I've just got one slide here which sort of summarizes it. So dot mesh is an open source primitive for people using Docker and Kubernetes in development and production that provides Docker volumes and Kubernetes PVs that can be committed, branched, pushed, and pulled like Git repos, but they can be terabytes in size and they can be atomically snapshotted. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Hey, Luke, what, 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 sorry, one more for, for data that does not live in volumes, like you know, S3 buckets or uh, time series databases or even, I mean, uh, other stuff. Do you, does dot mesh do anything for those or is it, are you relying only on stuff that lives in volumes? Um, so we are um, interested in um, supporting ETL into uh, dot mesh dots from things that would typically not run inside Kubernetes. Um, Actually, this comes on. I've got a, a backup slide here, sort of roadmap slide. Um, we're, we, we're in the process of defining the mesh. Um, I should actually move this arrow because <laughs> we're currently working on number two. Uh, we're currently working on adding production volumes into the mesh so that we integrate with reliable disks, like I was talking about earlier. But then number three on our roadmap is to bring production databases from things like RDS um, into the mesh because that's one of the things we learned from talking to lots of customers is um, very lots and lots and lots of people are just using the databases that are provided by the cloud provider. Um, but I think it still makes sense to try and bring those into the fold by being able to import from them um, and uh, bring data into earlier stages of the software development lifecycle um, that, that might uh, be fully sort of cloud native. So that would be an example where you're, you're not on the data path with RDS. Correct, yes. Okay. <laughs>
Cool. Any other questions? Look, um, yeah, one question. I noticed none of your dot mesh commands refer to a specific PVC or pod. Does it take a snapshot of the whole namespace, or how do you specify, you know, like your dot mesh commands in Kubernetes look just the same as they look in Docker? How do you know, like, the mappings between applications and their storage, or, you know, how does, how does that work? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, in order to make the commands short to type, um, there's a concept of current, uh, current remote and current dot and current branch, uh, which if you do a DM list, you'll see an asterisk next to the current dot, for example. Um, and so that allows you to, um, uh, to, to, keep, um, uh, to keep those things, um, to keep the commands as short as possible. Uh, we're, we've got a ticket open for adding explicit commands. So you could type DM dash dash remote equals GKE US dash dash dot equals MySQL dot dash dash branch equals master commit. Um, and that will be useful for when you're scripting things. Um, and it'll be useful for, for when you're not interacting with things as a human. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's just sort of client side state that's used to, um, uh, to make, to make the typing easier and to also make it seem more familiar with respect to Git as well, which has the same concept. I guess the part that is not clear to me is that whether dot mesh volumes are a new type of PVs in Kubernetes or are they like they work with, it's the way to populate other types of PVs in Kubernetes. Like, um, so think of dot mesh as a separate system that runs alongside Kubernetes on your cluster that can be deployed okay. to Kubernetes using Kubernetes. Like you can kubectl apply install dot mesh, um, and um, uh, and it's sitting alongside Kubernetes with its own sort of registry of dots with their names uh, that can also be exposed directly to Docker via the Docker volume plugin interface. Um, so when you refer to a dot name, that's a Kuben that's a dot mesh idea, but it can be mapped to from a PVC if that makes sense. Um, and that's why you, you have the same experience whether you're using the Docker integration or the dot mesh or the Kubernetes integration. Yeah, it's still not clear to me how <laughs> the mappings happen, like how dot mesh knows exactly which PVC is going to snap or populate or that part is not clear to me. Um, well, thank you. The, I'll the, 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 you PVC, the PVC YAML refers to a dot mesh name and namespace, which uniquely identifies the dot mesh dot and branch. So the dot mesh client would parse those YAMLs to um, see exactly what state you should capture? Um, the, the client doesn't need to parse the YAMLs because the, so the Kubernetes YAMLs uh, pin down a specific dot mesh dot. Um, and then the DM client can also pin down a specific dot mesh dot just by name. So it just relies on the names matching up. Okay, thanks. Cool. You, you, ha you have to use uh, dot meshes volumes, right? You're, you're using the CSI or the, the vo Docker volume plugin for all this to work. Yes, um, flex volume at the moment, but we'll implement CSI soon. Um, and, and yeah, um, the, 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 the important point though is that dot mesh on Kubernetes is going to be something which both consumes PVs and provides them. Um, because as I was saying earlier, we're not implementing dist uh, synchronously replicated storage for reliability. We're, we're consuming uh, systems that provide those guarantees um, and exposing upwards these sort of portable snapshotable um, volumes or dots. Look, is the model that you are actually passing through to an underlying volume or is the model that you know, a given container uses the dot mesh volume plugin and it goes to the dot mesh server or, and that, that itself is using other PVs for, for storage. It's more the latter because we can also provide multiple dots from one underlying PV. So you can get better density than like if you're using EBS as a backend, for example. So what can you say about like, if you had thousands of containers about kind of performance aspects of everything centralizing on a, on a dot mesh server? Uh, well, you can have multiple dot mesh servers. Um, that's why they're called clusters. So um, you can shard your dots across uh, your dot mesh servers. Um, you can kind of think of it like 
I don't know if this is a good analogy, but it's kind of like a cloud SAN in that yeah. you can have multiple backends. Um, and yes, access is going through dot mesh, uh, but the dot mesh backends are scalable and they can be scaled across multiple PVs um, that uh, interact with the backend, if that makes sense. Have you considered a model where it's a pass through to another PV at, at the container level? So you're just essentially a filter on top of, um, you know, some other underlying PV. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're sort of um, aggregating underlying PVs and using the fact that they're reliable to implement failover um, uh, while providing additional benefits and features on top. Yeah, I guess, I guess I was asking is if, uh, have you considered a model where you're not aggregating, but you're still providing features on top? So oh, essentially you could do that. Yeah, that, that could make sense. I mean, we could have a mode where we could have a config flag that says like, um, map one to one dot mesh dots onto underlying PVs, please. Um, Correct. and, right. uh, that might be beneficial or desirable for certain use cases, I expect. Cool. All, uh, all great questions. Uh, Luke, what's the best way to get a hold of you? It sounds like there's still lots of questions to follow up. Yeah, please do. Uh, come and join our Slack. Uh, so if you go to dotmesh.com, scroll all the way to the bottom of the page, it's a really tiny link. It's hidden under community in the footer. Uh, there's a direct link to the Slack invite, um, invite link on dotmesh.com. So yeah, please come and join our Slack. Uh, if you want to reach me personally, I'm Luke at dotmesh.com. Excellent. Thanks a lot, man. I really appreciate you uh, doing the presentation. That was excellent. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Thank you for letting me take almost the whole time in your meeting. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice work, guys. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Thank you. All right. So uh, we've got five minutes left. Uh, just a couple uh, administrative things. So one at KubeCon EU, at, uh, EU, we had three sessions. We've given up the third one. That was a late night session that uh, didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, so we now have two for the SWG. One is an intro, one's the advanced. Regarding the intro, uh, that's been moved, so it no longer conflicts with the Kubernetes, Kubernetes uh, storage SIG. So um, that's a great thing. And then regarding the, the advanced session, uh, that we're, we've invited uh, members of the TOC to come talk to us about Charter. And, and I think you know, some people on the, the, in the group have been reached out to by Camille. And Camille's been asking about you know, what's going on with SUG and what do you want it to do, et cetera. So if you have an invite from, from her, please do take the meeting and, and uh, let her know what you think, because uh, they're going to take some of that feedback. And, and hopefully by KubeCon EU, we can make things more clear and start, uh, in terms of the charter and what the, the TOC is looking for. Um, and then regarding the, the actual session planning, uh, I think that we'll probably talk about that next time and form, uh, you know, from the people who volunteered, we'll, we'll see uh, who can start working on it for, for the event. Um, anything else? Ben, do you have any, any other comments? Anyone else? Perfect. Thanks, Clint. And thanks, Luke. Excellent. You're welcome. All right, guys. So we'll give everybody back uh, four minutes in their day. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.